Once you see that we're broadcasting, I guess we are right now, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Joaquin. My name is Christian Batista, and I will be chairing today's session. As you know, uh, our next speaker, Xiaoliang Chi, is a recipient of the Herman Kummer Early Achievement Award in Many Body Physics. And, and this, um, this award honors Professor Kummer's long and distinguished career as a leader in the field and as a mentor for younger generations. So uh, this particular year, I am chairing the selection committee. So I would like to use this opportunity to invite you to submit nominations. Normally, we only accept candidates that receive their PhD within a period of six years prior to the closing date for nominations. But since our next conference has been postponed to September 22 uh, due to the pandemic, only for this time, um, our committee will accept candidates that received their PhD in 2015. So you can find all the relevant information in, in the wiki link that I posted on the chat, right? So I, I really invite you, you know, and encourage you to, to send nominations, you know, for young scientists. And with that, I will let, let you know, Joaquin introduce um, Xiaoliang. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. I think if you have posted something on the chat, uh, you might want to post it again so people that have just joined uh, can see it. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, the, uh, the, the uh, conference website uh, that uh, uh, everybody has, uh, has gotten on, on email, I think. And there you also have uh, links to the conference wiki and all the information on the, um, on the award as well. So uh, uh, like Christian was saying, uh, we're very happy to have Xiaoliang uh, here today. Uh, so I will mention uh, a few, uh, uh, I will make a few comments uh, as a way of introducing him. Although I think for many of you, uh, uh, Xiaoliang does not really need an introduction. Uh, so he got his PhD at the Institute for Advanced Study at Tsinghua University in 2007. And then he was a postdoc at uh, Slack and, and, and at Microsoft Station Q. And uh, uh, soon after that, he joined the faculty at Stanford in 2009 and where he is now as full professor since 2019. Among uh, multiple owners, uh, uh, Xiaoliang is a Sloan Fellow, is a Packard Fellow, and a Simons Investigator. Uh, and uh, more relevant for our uh, purpose here for this talk uh, and for this series is that he's a recipient, like Christian said, of the Hermann Kummel Early Achievement of Art in Many Body Physics. And now, without uh, further ado, once again, we're very happy to have Xia Liang Ji, who will tell us about quantum information measure of space-time correlation. Go ahead. Hey, um, thanks, Joaquin, for the for the invitation and uh, for the introduction. Um, and it's uh, my great honor to be a recipient of the Herman Kumar Award, and um, um, I'm really glad that um, we are having this um, um, this uh, um, meeting um, for quantum many body today so um just to cl cl uh, clarify okay so um does the webinar form means the uh, questions are all reserved to the end or i, I mean I, I would prefer to have questions but i don't know how it, how it works uh, okay so uh, normally we keep the questions for the end but if you prefer questions throughout the talk um i think christian if this is okay with you we can uh, tell the the um the audience simply raise their hand and then we can relay the questions to the speaker is that okay? Sure. Okay, so the audience can use the raise hand feature. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think uh, just yeah, just uh, um, if uh, there is any um, point where it's uh, unclear, um, please let me know. Um, so so this uh, talk, uh, the topic today I, I will talk about is uh, is a uh, a recent work uh, that. Uh, um, I'm, I'm doing in collaboration with Paolo Glorioso and Jinbin Yang, um, two postdocs at Stanford. And we are, um, this is a, a topic in quantum information in many body physics, which is about, uh, about how to gen um, generalize some quantum information measures to space time correlation. Um, so hopefully it will fit this uh, scenario of this. Uh, um, um, Quantum many body day is certainly some topic uh, about quantum many body physics. Um, although you will see it's um, um, it's kind of a more pure, more uh, quantum information um, work. So um, so the motivation is 
Okay, so, so the outline is that I will start with some discussion of the motivation, and then um, I will give a review of the mutual information that probably many of you are familiar with, um, which is a measure of correlation in quantum states. And then we want to generalize that to space time, and I will discuss, uh, I will define a generalization and then discuss several um, different um, properties of this uh, uh, new quantity we define and uh, um, discuss the, how it bounds correlation function in a similar way as mutual information. Um, and then I will discuss um, some um, example and open question. Um, so, so if I, let's think about, um, <clears throat> uh, for example, a quantum field theory, um, like the picture on the left side is supposed to be like a quantum field theory. So although the discussion today, I will mainly, I will focus on like a uh, system with finite Hilbert space dimension. Um, but um, so you can think of um, just in your mind, you can think of either like a continuous system, like a quantum field theory, or like a discrete system, like a quantum circuit that we draw on the right side. So it, um, what we understand well is how to describe correlations between independent regimes, which in the relativity term means the space or space or um, space like separated regimes. So uh, it's because it's easier to draw in in the quantum field theory. So I would draw it on the left side. So um, you see if I um, there is a light cone. So <clears throat> um, so you, you you have a region A, then it has a future um, future light cone. So let me see. I thought I can. Oh, maybe I cannot draw. Yeah, so, so you have this, uh, this region here, which is like the future light cone of A. So, so usually what we understand is we can, if I give you a region A and a region C, and they are space-like separated, means C is totally outside the light cone of A. Then um, we know how to characterize correlation between A and C, because you can always draw this uh, red dashed line, like you can always draw a Cauchy surface, which means I can do time evolution up to the red line, the dashed line, uh, then define a quantum state there. Um, basically, like if you have A and C at the same time, you just define the quantum state at that time. And if you they are not at the same time, it's like you evolve that part of the, it's like you, you, you do some additional time evolution here um, on top of this time t equal to zero state, um, but that has nothing to do with A. Right? So, you, so it's well defined that you will define a state in, in this red dash line. And then uh, you can do partial trace and then study uh, the, um, the state of A and C. And then the state determines all the correlation. So we can use different measures to characterize the correlation and mutual information is one of them. Uh, and then the question is like, now the, the question is, um, now what if I have two regions A and B, which are not time-like, not space-like separated, but they are, so they are culturally related, like events happening in A could affect B. Um, so in that case, it's clear that we cannot describe this correlation with a quantum state. It's uh, not only a property of the quantum state, it's also a property of the time evolution from A to B. Um, but it still makes sense to ask the same question because we know correlation between A and B is important. It's, uh, it's well defined and it's important. It's like, for example, response function, like I could do some perturbation in A and then see what's the response in B. I could study time order correlation or more general Caldish um, contour correlation functions. So all these things are well defined, but they are not characterized by a quantum state. So we want to find uh, some quantum information measure that describes how much correlation there are. Um, and you can ask uh, the same question um, in the discrete case. Like if you have a quantum circuit, where when I draw the quantum circuit, I always, I'm always taking the convention that time goes up, upward. So um, when you uh, when you have every box here represents a uh, unitary, so um, you have many qubits and then the, the, there is unitary uh, operators applying to uh, pairs of qubits as an example. And then the same way there is like a light cone, like uh, if you have region C that's outside this dash line, uh, the, this blue dash line light cone, then um, it's independent from A. So the, any correlation between A C is, related, is determined by a quantum state. Um, which you can define here. But um, um, if you have a B correlation, then we have the same question that it's not, it's a, 
correlated in it's correlated causally, and uh, um, we, we need to define a new measure. And uh, um, the motivation of defining a new, uh, some quantum information measure is you want you want a measure of correlation that's independent from what operator you use, because it is um, so. That's one nice thing for um, quantum information measures. Like you want some something that's intrinsic to the to the to the system. You don't want it to depend on what operator you use to probe it. Maybe when you probe it in the wrong operator, it's going to um, uh, look like uncorrelated, but actually it's correlated when you look at other operators. Oh, it's, it turns out this doesn't stay. Sorry, I thought that maybe it's different from the, um, the ordinary zoom because I thought I could write on the slide, but it doesn't seem to be um, the case. Okay, so um, so we start with, so let me first review the, the well-known case of uh, spatial correlation. So when you have space-like related regimes, then um, you, you can define a quantum state and then you can define the reduced quantum state of AB. So that's the review density matrix. You take the state and partial trace over everything else, you get rho AB. And then rho AB will determine all the correlation function. So it will also determine connected correlation function. So if I define this connected correlation function, can you see my cursor, my uh, the, the pointer? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so this connected correlation function is determined by rho AB because the first term is just the expression value of OAOB, and then the second term is is the expression value of OA and OB separately, which can be computed using rho A and rho B. So um, so actually it's a uh, Convenient to write it in a way that um, so it's, it's convenient to write it. Um, sorry. Um, you can write um, this. Sorry, I will give up. It's a, I just I don't know why it just doesn't work. Um, okay. So you can write it in terms of the expectation value of OA, OB in rho AB minus rho A, rho B. Um, right? so, so you see the second term factorized. So, um, so that tells me like how if I know rho AB, I will compute this difference of rho AB with the, with the um, product state, where rho A and rho A rho B is like the reduced state from rho AB. Right? So rho A is like partial trace of B of rho AB and similar for rho B. So if you have rho AB, you can, you can determine this difference and that determines connected correlation of all possible operators. And then, uh, so using this um, now you can, so there is a quantum information measure um, independent from the operator you use, which is the mutual information that is defined as SA plus SB minus SAB. Um, and uh, uh, here the entropy SA is just the Neumann entropy. So you see like if A and B have no correlation, like if state is a product state, then the, um, the entropy will just add. So you will get uh, mutual information equals to zero. So that's the saying that the mutual information is a, uh, um, is a measure of uh, correlation. And uh, um, so more precisely, um, mutual information is a, a bound of uh, correlation. So as is shown in this paper, um, mutual information is a, an upper bound of all the connected correlation. So if you take a connected correlation OAOB, uh, I put a C here just to indicate it's connected part, it's subtracting the, the disconnected part. OAOB connected um, square divided by, uh, I think I missed some squares in the norm, divided by um, the some norm of A and B. So it's, it's saying like if you take operators um, which has the norm one, then the, the connected correlation function squared divided by two is bounded by mutual information. And I'm going to go back to this, uh, um, this, this formula. Uh, so, so this is um, one thing that we will um, generalize. So, 
and I'm going to explain why there is this uh, this bound. Um, so, but basically, what this uh, um, tells us is that indeed the mission automation gives you a um, a measure of correlation. Like if you have a small mission automation, then you are guaranteed no matter what operator you try, you're not going to get a big correlation. Uh, the other side is not true. Like if mission automation could be much bigger. This bound could be not good. It could be not a type. Um, mission automation can be quite big because it goes. It could grow up with the entropy of the system. But the mission. But the left side is always at the most the other one. So I just want to clarify that this is not the only reason mission automation is useful, and uh, um, and it's, uh, this equation is basically only useful when it's small, when mission automation is small. Um, but the other, so so there are some other important uh, properties. Um, one one is the one important property of mission automation is the monotonicity. It means that if you take your state with A and B, and then you um, apply a quantum channel to A and B, or or to either of them or both. Uh, then the mission automation can only go down. So intuitively, what happened is in this picture here. Um, intuitively, what happened is that um, is is that if you you apply a quantum channel to B, it basically means that you take any auxiliary system, you take any other system, which which has no entanglement with either with anything else with A or B, and then you couple it with B. You introduce a unitary, let's say, introduce a unitary here where you couple that additional system to B. And then you get a new state of B and C, right? So then now, if you trace over that C, if you look at the correlation between A and B, it can only go down. That's an important property because that tells you um, this mutual information is measuring correlations that are intrinsic to the state. Like you, you um, like if you can do something local, um, like in B, which has nothing to do with A, and then it could increase this quantity, then it won't be interesting because it's measuring something that's that. That's not a correlation. Right? That's something that you can do. You can change locally. Um, so this this is, this uh, this monotonicity here is telling you that that the things you locally do, like uh, couple with another quantum system, um, can only reduce mutual information. Um, so so in particular, in particular, um, a consequence of this is that if you if you reduce a system size, like if you have a subsystem A is here. And subsystem B C is a is a region here. And then now, if you trace over C, the mission information of A B is always smaller or equal to the, that of A and B C. So if you change the size of B, um, if it goes down, then the mission information goes down. So that's also natural. It tells you that um, if you have a smaller system, you have less operators you can probe. So there's less correlation. Um, okay. So then um, the other important uh, thing to mention is also will play an important role in um, it will play an important role in the um, in the generalization is that um, the the, the, the mutual formation is actually a relative entropy. So let me first define what is relative entropy. So the relative entropy is this uh, formula here, which is um, if you take two quantum states, then um, it contains two terms. One term, the first term is just a minus the entropy of rho, and the second term is like a cross um, entropy that you have a trace rho log sigma. Um, so um, now if you take a sigma to be rho a times rho b, and then um, you take rho to be rho a b, so rho a times rho b is also a well-defined quantum state. So if you take a sigma to be rho a times rho b, and then you find that um, the first term is just entropy of rho a b, so it's s a b, and then the second term is a log of the Dirac product state, so it's just a log of the first plus log of the second. So it, it turns out it's just s a plus s b. So mutual information is actually a relative entropy of these two states. And why is that uh, useful? Um, so basically, um, relative entropy has a lot of nice properties. For example, this monotonicity, as I, as we just said, like if you do something to the state. To both states, you do the same thing to both states, rho and sigma. Then the relative entropy can only go down. So, so um, that's so the mutual information has the same monotonicity, which is just a consequence that it's a relative entropy. And 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 the other thing that's uh, very nice is that we know um, we have another um, interpretation of relative entropy. Um, sorry, I didn't put the I, I um, didn't put the reference here, but this basically is a standard result already in. Quantum information. Um, 
uh, for example, you can read it in this uh, recent review of uh, Edward Witten about quantum information theory. Um, so, so this uh, um, so this uh, relative entropy has um, had another interpretation, um, which is hypothesis testing. So, roughly speaking, relative entropy is telling me how different are the two states. So, it also that makes sense because so mutual, mutual information is measuring how much correlation there are. But in this way, we can say it's measuring how different row AB is from row A cross row B. So row A cross row B is the state if you don't have correlation, right? So, so that makes sense. So measuring correlation means measuring how different are the two states. Two states. But you could measure it with different ways, right? You could take a difference and calculate a norm, right? You could take a, the difference between row AB and row A cross row B and then measure some norm. So one difference from other measure is relative entropy has this, uh, this operational meaning um, in the setup called the hypothesis testing. Um, um, so the setup is that, let's say um, I, I have a state and the state could be, um, there, should, um, there should be a row here, I don't know why. Um, sorry for the technical problems I'm used to. Um, Should be a row here. Um, so, um, so the idea is that um, you, you give me a state of sigma and row. There are two different states. So um, I have like a black box and I hide one of the two states and I give it to you and you don't know which one, but you know it's one of the two. You know it's sigma or row. Then um, you do some, you do your quantum measurements to tell. You try to tell whether it's sigma or row. For example, the simple case will be at, at the sigma and row is like spin up and spin down, pure state then it will be easy, right? So you just measure a spin and then you know. Um, so, so that's easy. But more generally, like if I give you sigma is a maximum limit state, it could be up or down, it's a random uh, mixture and rho is like a, a, a spin up. Then it will be a little more difficult to, to tell, right? Because you do a measurement, you get spin, um, you, you get spin up, then it, it may not mean it's rho. Sigma could also have a chance to get spin up, right? So, um, um, so, so um, but, you, are, you try to do your best in doing the measurements. And then um, let's say you figure out a way to measure the state so that if it's sigma, um, the measurement will tell you it's sigma. Like the measurement gives you an output bit, which is yes or no. So if I give you a state sigma, it always say yes. And then in that case, if I give you rho, it may make a mistake. It may not always tell you, no, it's not a sigma. Um, it, it may tell you by mistake that it's, it's rho. Uh, sorry, it may tell you by mistake that's sigma. So sigma is the state you, you, sigma is your hypothesis and rho is your real state, physical state. So, um, so what's the chance of making a mistake? The chance of error that you mistake and rho by sigma is Pn and, and N here is the number of measurements, the number of states you are given. So, so because for if I, you imagine if I give you a quantum state and you are only allowed to measure it once, it will be very hard, right? Because in general, you, you don't know, you, you measure some, something, the output is, is randomly um, one, of the, one of the eigenvalues and you only get it once, then it will be very hard. So, um, so the setup is that you are given n copies. So you are allowed to take n copies and do a measurement on all the n at the same time. And in this setup then, if you do a measurement that sigma, you, you have a test that gives you output, that yes, it's sigma or no. Then the output for sigma is 100% chance yes. Then the chance for rho to, to get also a yes is a, a probability. And the, the probability of error decays exponentially with n. So if you have many copies, um, if the two states are different, you can always tell it. But the, the, how, but the rate, the, uh, how the probability of error decays with n is determined by the relative entropy. And so this is, uh, if, you, if you didn't hear it before, it may sound very um, complicated, but the, the point is that this is a very concrete and uh, general um, definition. Right? So, so it's operational, like I, um, I give you many copies of states and then you try to tell them they're apart. And then the chance that you make a mistake is uh, determined by relative entropy. It, 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 this uh, this uh, um, exponential decay rate. Um, so, so, 
sorry, I need the slides keep frozen. I don't know what happened, but the slides, I cannot sleep. it. You want to try unsharing and sharing again? I don't know what happened. I can't even unshare. Um, it just it has a, a, a choice of a new share. Okay, let's see. Perhaps um, our host yet you can help us. Can you see? Uh, it's just I don't know why. Yeah, every time when I I write something and then I stop writing, then it's it's frozen and I cannot cannot scroll. Um, delete. Hey. I see. Okay. Let's see. Um. I I think maybe it's just a problem. My computer is. Um, okay. Now we stop the share. Maybe let's try sharing again. Okay, maybe I will just avoid the uh, um, writing more thing. Um, sorry, but does it work? That's fine. Whatever works for you, that's fine. It's still just, uh, sorry. It's... Let me, let me. I think something is very wrong, yeah. Sorry, I... This never happened before. I need to, um, I, let me just restart my slide. So I'm trying to force, force the, the PowerPoint to restart. Okay. Can you see the slide? Yep, yeah, that seems to work. Seems to okay, so I would just I would just uh, stop writing. Yeah, it's, it's just so um, confusing. Um, yeah. So okay. So the so I, I was saying I was saying that the um, the, the mutual formation or the relative entropy guarantee um, the relative entropy determines the rate of error when you try to uh, determine which state it is. And then um, so if relative entropy is zero, it means there is no hope to tell the two states apart. If it's infinite, it could be infinite in general. If it's infinite, then it means that you can tell the the two states apart immediately. Um, so going back to mutual information, that means that we could uh, formulate this uh, measure of correlation uh, in this hypothesis testing language. We could say that I give you a black box and it could have a state row A times row B or row AB. And uh, I don't tell you which one it is. Then uh, just like this picture, then um, then if you guess it's uh, the right side, if you guess it's the uncorrelated state, and, and what's the chance it's actually the, the row AB. And uh, with a bigger mutual information, it's easier to tell the two states apart. And so it, the, this probability of error decays more fast, decays faster. 
Okay, so um, so that that's a um, and and that relation, the relation between relative entropy and neutral information is also responsible for the relation the upper bound of correlation function. So this is the um, the proof in this uh, Wolf uh, versus Theta um, Hastings Sirac paper, where um, so they they use that relative entropy is bound is upper bound of uh, one norm. Um, and then the one norm is the upper bound of, uh, of uh, difference in expectation values. So, so if you take the two states rho and sigma to be rho a b and rho a cross rho b, this difference of expectation value is exactly the connected correlation function. So that's why the connected correlation function is bounded by one norm and then in turn is bounded by, by the mutual information. Um, so we will do the similar thing in space time. Okay, so um, now going to um, the space time generalization, so the, so the idea is that we want to basically just do the same thing as the hypothesis testing because it has the advantage of being very um, operational, and we want to do that in space time. So um, so what what you do is that you consider two n copies of the same physical system, and I like the picture on the right side. Again, time goes up. So I'm drawing like I have an initial state, and then there is a time evolution, and then I consider two regions A and B. So in general, they are time-like separated. They could be also happen to be space-like separated. So in general, let me draw them at two different times. So A and B, although the pictures seem to show here they have the same size, in general, they don't have to. They have to, they could have different number of qubits. And then um, the setup is that I can take an ancilla W, which coupled to A and B in any way I want. So I'm just doing a general experiment. The only rule is that you can only do experiments in this time space time region A and space time region B. It's like a, a, a system where you do experiment, you only have access at this two time in the particular region, special regions. So um, other than that, you have no constraint. You could have a huge uh, quantum computer, you could have a very big um, uh, quantum state uh, W, and you have access in the same way as the spatial, the hypothesis testing case. You have access to n copies of the system, and the reason why I want two n rather than n is I want to have the pro have the two different cases written here. One case is we are measuring it's like the analog of uh, um, row a cross row b. It's like when I have a what, what does that mean? I'm measuring disconnected correlation. It means that I take a system and then measure um, operators in a, and then I can take other copies of systems and measure in b. Right? So. So, so basically I have two n copies and then the case zero here is when I um, when I measure n copies, I only measure A and the other n copies, I only measure B. So technically you formulate that by having a control bit which controls whether you take a swap between the two n copies. Um, but basically what it does is just, uh, just you either measure A or B but you don't do it in the same system. And then the case one is the connected correlation which means you, you apply A and B in the same n copies of system. So now um, this whole thing in the gray box is, is unknown to you. Like you don't know whether it's case zero or one and you try to do the measurements in A and B regions and tell them apart. And then you can define the same error rate um, with the, uh, and, de and that defines a new quantity which we call the um, space time neutral information. And uh, um, so if I draw explicitly these two cases, yeah, the case zero and one, you'll see like in the case zero, a and B, you're at A and B, you're accessing the system to different copies. So what you get will always be disconnected. The correlation function will be uh, always uh, factorized. And then in the case one, it's uh, connected. So um, so then we can define this, um, um, define our space-time mutual information as an upper bound, as a maximum of um, um, of the relative entropy between the output state of W. So, so you, you do whatever you want, and in the end, uh, you're, you want to get information about the system um, in your um, lab equipment W. So, um, so you take that state, um, sigma W, which, which could be different for the two different inputs, and then you try to tell them apart. So you just look at the relative entropy of that, uh, um, that two system, that two uh, state of W and then maximize over the, all the operations VA, VB you do, which are generally two unitaries. Um, so, so one simplification is that you don't really need to optimize over VB because VB, um, will, because VB generally will take the state of row B, take the state of B, uh, B and take the state of um, here in the blue dash line of B and W, 
and then do some more things to it. And, uh, and as that's, that's only going to reduce neutron formation according to what we said earlier. So uh, that's only going to reduce the relative entropy. So the maximum will be, you just take the whole B and W, like you do a swap gate and take B out and then, um, and then um, combine that with the state of W here. So, so the VB, you can just choose to be the swap gate and then you, you're only left with the maximization over VA. So in general, we can, we can only look at the, we, we can look at the circuit that's up to the, sorry, up to the, dash, the blue dash line. So you can just look at the state here, which is called rho BW. Um, and, and you can just look at the relative entropy of the rho BW state between the state, the case zero and one. In the case zero, it's always factorized because rho B has nothing to do with the W. So, so, so it's similar to the mutual formation case. It's a relative entropy between the non-factorized state and the factorized state. Okay, so, um, so some different comments about the, um, this uh, quantity. So now if we, um, um, now we can discuss some different uh, um, properties of this quantity. But so, so first of all, so it, it will grow, it will either stay the same or grow as, as n become bigger. So of course, if you can access more copies of the system, you can learn more, like you may learn more. So it's only going to grow. Um, and then we define the limit to be like the, uh, the quantity that's correspond to mutual information. And then, um, so if, uh, if A and B are space like separated, then this will be the same as the original mutual information because the uh, because in that case, um, whatever you do in uh, in B has has no correlation with A, so it has no um, uh, causal um, relation with A. So 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 you can just uh, take the A take the whole whole A out by, by another swap, like this picture here. Like if I have a quantum circuit and then A and B are space like separated, like A and B does not um, like A, A has no causal um, relation with B, then I can just take a swap and then take out the state of A um, to my W. So now looking at, uh, looking at the relative entropy of BW between the connected and disconnected case is just calculating mutual information between B and W. And that's the same as calculating mutual information of A and B in the original state. Um, yeah, so, so the more complicated case, case is when a and B are not um, space like separated. And so let me comment on some different properties of this, uh, this quantity. So first uh, um, we need to check it has the same kind of monotonicity. It means that um, if I do anything to A and B before I put them into this uh, quantum channel, uh, before I put them in coupling with W, then, uh, then that can only reduce uh, this uh, space time mutual information. So that's, that just follows from the, the property of relative entropy. So if you, if you do something to B, like apply a quantum channel, which means you couple it to some other system and trace over that system. If you do that, it's obvious that uh, it's going to, only going to reduce the relative entropy um, uh, because the relative entropy has that monotonicity. It's slightly more non-trivial to show that for, for A because you didn't trace over A, like didn't take a state of A, but you can still prove that because if you couple any part, any you, you couple A with any other system and then trace over that system, it's the same as you just include that extra system in W and then later trace it over. So, um, so you can show that that just corresponds to another choice of W, which is slightly bigger and another choice of VA. So that's why like the upper bound will never go up, will never become bigger. Um, so, okay, so that, that's good because that tells me this is indeed an intrinsic measure of correlation. It cannot increase locally. Um, and uh, and uh, one, one useful thing is to mention that this uh, relative entropy, you can write it in terms of, you can write it in two terms. You can expand it out because the rho BW, like the state with, uh, uh, with no correlation is uh, factorized. So you can write this uh, in, ter in, term in the sum of two terms. The first term is you, like, you look at case one, you take your system, you take your W and Sila couple to the system and then look at the mutual information between B and W in that state. And interestingly, that's not the only term. That's, uh, um, th that's naively, that's the, most, that's the first guess of a measure of space-time correlation that you, you just take your ancilla couple with the system, look at mutual information. Right? So, so, um, but that's uh, not the, the whole um, quantity. There is a second term, which is a relative entropy between 
between rho b zero, which is the state without coupling to w, like the state in the case zero case. In the case zero, it doesn't couple with w because the coupling with w happens in other copies. So that's rho b zero. And rho b is the state in, this, in the case one where you couple with w, but you don't look at your measurement result. You trace over w. So the, that's an interesting difference. And so because when a and b are not space-like separated, you do some measurement to a, even if you don't look at the result, it changes the state of b. So this is the this this term is in, is uh, is in charge of that. It tells you that this is so this is a new term that doesn't exist in the space like separated case. So you you, you can um, take so so it tells you how different uh, 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 the measurement in A makes even if you don't look at the measurement result. Okay, so um, so that's one property of this uh, uh, mission emission, and then because of the um, so this. Uh, a relation between mutual remission and space time uh, between mutual remission and correlation function, we want to um, ask if the same thing is true um, for the space time generalization. So it turns out that to bound the, uh, in order to bound the correlation function, we only need the J1, which means uh, like in general, in, in general, when I make the definition, I allow the system, allow you to access all the n copies, or actually two n copies of the system. Um, so we um, so so in, uh, we don't know. Um, this is a, one of the open questions. Like I don't know whether you actually get a bigger J n um, by going to higher number of copies. Um, but to bound the correlation function, we only need to accept one copy. So uh, so it means in the case zero, you need two copies. But in the case one, there is two copies, but you only accept one. So so that's the that's what I call J one. So it's it's a um, you only have access to one copy, um, and then so like like the picture on the right side here. So you have only a single copy of the system applied unitary, and then um, the way we prove this uh, correlation bound is um, we basically we can just design some particular unitary um, that acts on L and W that acts on A and W. Um, because this uh, J1 is defined as you couple W with A in arbitrary way and then calculate that uh, uh, relative entropy of the output state of B and W and then maximize over VA. Right? So if I can find any particular realization of this uh, VA um, that uh, uh, bounds correlation function, then that's enough. Right? So, so we have, there is a way to, um, there is a way to do this, uh, which is basically just, uh, it's really just uh, writing down um, um, a physical way to do quantum measurements. So, so if you think about what is what do, do I mean by I have an equipment and I do a measurement to A, then um, you, in the simplest case of projective measurement, you apply some projectors to A, uh, like you measure a spin and you get up or down. So that means that you apply the projector to either up or down, and depending on the output of the projector, you record the result in, in your lab equipment. And what does recording mean? It basically means that you start with a state zero, like I draw here. Um, you start with state zero, and then um, you apply a projector, and then depending on the projector output A, you just do a unitary rotation in your state W, and then you get a, um, you, you get a state A output. Right? So now W knows whether the spin is up or not, or down. And, uh, um, and more precisely, and um, if you want to be more precise, what uh, um, what uh, you you really do is you 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 take many copies of this result, and as long as you trace over some of them, the record becomes classical. But that's not so important here because we assume W could be arbitrarily large, so we can just do this in W itself. Um, it's like W is your the whole notebook, like you do a measurement of spin, and then you write down the result. And uh, uh, and then the generalization is you can generalize projective measurements to POVM. And so you can generalize, um, you can, instead of projectors, you can just define some operators X, and then the only requirement is that the sum over them is identity. So, so basically this is like um, um, some component, it's like a, I have an isometry from A to A and W, and then um, the for each given output of W, it's some components of, uh, of a unitary. So it's like there's three parts of the unitary and when you sum over them, you get identity. So you, you, can, you can think of basically 
you can put an x0, x1, x2 together, that will be a rectangular matrix. Like each of them is a, is a square matrix. It's a rectangular matrix, which means it, which maps state from A, a state of A to state of AW. So here we choose a particular choice. Like if I want to bound a particular correlation function between A and B, which is a, a particular operator OA, then I can always normalize it by dividing by the norm. And then I can define this. Uh, so X, X1 is just identity. X, uh, sorry, X0 is just identity. X1 is that operator normalized. So it's smaller than one now. So all the eigenvalues are smaller than one. And then X2 is just whatever, um, like whatever is left. If you take the identity minus OA square, that's just to um, satisfy this equation. Right? So now, um, uh, and then I put in a probability P, which we will determine later. So we can, we can do this for any P, right? So, so this, what this means is that um, I am just uh, um, applying that uh, POVM to A and then record the result. Okay, so now, um, now I could, uh, um, now what I want to do is I want to translate this correlation function between A and B to a correlation function between W and B. So the idea is that um, I have the state W, which remembers what operator has been applied here. So in particular, let's focus on the first two. It could be identity or it could be this one. It, um, it could be X2, but I'm not interested in that. So now if I, after that, I got the state of W and then I apply a operator in W, which looks at the, looks like, looks at a off diagonal uh, term um, that start with the, um, that, so then, so you you want to look at a um, off diagonal term. Um, that that means you insert an operator OA um, in one side of the density operator, and then you insert identity in the other side. So, for example, if I'm interested in probing the um, the, the response function, then um, it's a commutator, which means you you have um, OA either put on the left side of OB or you put it on the um, um, right side of OB. Uh, or, or, um, equivalently, you, you could say, yeah, if you put OA on the left side of the row of the initial state row or the other, on the right side. Um, and that's done by you couple, you introduce that coupling um, uh, with W and then you look at the, the sigma Y operator in the zero one state. So you look at the sigma Y operator in zero one. So you don't look at the two. Then, um, then the expression value of that operator, um, when you, you insert that operator and also insert OB, then what you get is, is exactly that coefficient times the, the response function. Um, and then you can check that the kinetic correlation function is zero. So, so, so basically what we are doing is we are relating that kinetic correlation function to some ordinary, like uh, expectation value of an operator in the combined system BW the difference of that in the two cases. And once we do that, we know how to bound that by relative entropy in the same way as before. So, so that therefore we get, um, so like this, this line here is just a standard derivation, um, um, the same way as, as uh, in the Wolf et al paper uh, for space-like case. And then the, the, the difference is just here, like in that particular setup, if we choose that particular YW, and then that coupling with W, then this is equal to the kinetic correlation function, uh, equals to the response function. And then you could just max, make the tight, make the bound tight by choosing P equals to one half, that's just to maximize this coefficient. Um, so we can do the same proof for the other, for the anti-commutator. I, I want to see if a similar bound holds for anti-commutator, because if, if you have a bound for a commutator and anti-commutator, then that means that the, the, the um, time order correlation is also bounded. The time order or anti time order correlation, they are also bounded. And the same is true. And, and uh, you just choose a different, instead of the poly matrix uh, X in the zero one space, you can choose poly, sorry, instead of poly matrix Y, you choose poly matrix X. And, uh, and in that case, the second term is not zero. So just to remind you, you know, in that case, really, you need uh, uh, to subtract the connected part, and that's the second term. Okay, so um, so some comments about this result. So if you go to space like separate region, this actually reduces to the Wolf result. You just take this formula, and in the space like case, the anti commutator, the, the, the two operators commute. So the anti commutator is just 
two times the, the OLB. So if you take that out, this exactly becomes the uh, the previous results. And um, and 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 uh, just some common uh, physically, physically this um, this this is basically saying that that um, if you have any um, correlation function like a, a time order correlation or a response function or anything like this could be measured by uh, ancilla. That's why like I could couple it to ancilla and then look at the ancilla and B rather than A and B and you don't lose anything. That's the point. Right? So the point is that um, anything you can measure between A and B, you can also measure between B and W. So the quantity we define, which is the relative entropy of the states in B and W for connected and disconnected, that is sufficient to bound correlation between A and B. So I think that's the physical meaning. And, uh, um, and, and uh, by the way, uh, com a side uh, comment is that um, in response function case, if you only look at the commutator, because the connected correlation is zero, so it doesn't really matter what you put there. So you actually could replace rho bw zero here by the rho b cross rho w, by like the reduced states of the rho bw one. If you do that, then it's bounded by mutual transformation between b and w. Remember that's one of the two terms. So, so you will get a tighter bound in that way, but that will not apply to the to the to the anti-commutator. So in general, you need this uh, J1, and and but in special case, um, you can you can define um, you, you can define an upper bound using only the the mutual information term. Um, and we also have other um, bounds which I will just briefly mention. So. I mean, the point is that by coupling the system to ancilla, you can do different kinds of couplings and then measure different correlation functions. So the response function is just one example of that. I could also look at other kinds of correlations. And one example is this causal influence, which was uh, what uh, um, we proposed in this uh, earlier work by, with Jordan Kozler, CJ Han, and Zhao Yang and me. Um, where we were trying to ask, answer, like, if I, if I give you a quantum circuit, it's kind of pretty obvious, like uh, where is the light cone, like uh, which space-time region influence which part. But uh, in general, we can consider more general tensor networks, and then the space-time geometry may be not obvious. I need to find out where is my light cone. And that's, uh, that motivates us to define this causal influence, which means basically you insert a unitary, which I call RA here. You insert a unitary RA in region A, and then ask how does that change the expectation value of our Hermitian operator in B. So that fits this, uh, set, this current setup pretty well. So you could um, um, do a similar, um, similar setup as we discussed earlier. So you could uh, have a W that's a qubit, and then, then there are you are doing a POVM, and uh, uh, one operator is just identity, and the other is the unitary I. Uh, so, um, so that satisfies this uh, uh, condition. Um, so, so, um, so you introduce that, and then, um, then you just need to measure. You take that W, which is a single qubit, and measure the Z component. If you measure the Z spin Z component, then you get exactly the the difference. That's equal to the difference of the expectation value for OB with the unitary RA applied or not. But that difference divided by normalization is exactly translated into a correlation function between ZW and OB. So once you do that, then, uh, then of course, uh, because that's true for all RA, that's also true for the maximum, which is the causal influence. I, I should mention, I should uh, clarify that this definition is a bit different from what we have in our paper because the normalization is different. Um, but uh, so yeah, because of how, what norm you divide it. So, so um, but typically it's, uh, it's measuring the same kind of causal influence. So yeah, so this tells us that the causal influence is also bounded by the mutual information between A and B. Um, um, but of course, um, the bound doesn't have to be tight. I mean, like in space-like cases, the color influence is zero, but the mutual information is not zero. So they are measuring different things. The, the J1, the J or J1, is the uh, space-time mutual information is measuring correlation without caring whether it's causal. And the color influence is caring whether it's causal. Um, yeah, I will skip this discussion about the upper bound. I'm just trying to give an upper bound like mutual information. Um, but that's that's mainly for uh, um, more. Math. I think that's more like a math, math question. Um, yeah. So so if we consider uh, um, 
so so example then a simplest example is like a thermal state like if i have a dynamics that's a uh, scrambling that's a uh, um that's a uh, um introduce thermalization then that's a simple example because i know um my i, I know more thing knowledge about my state rho b like whatever i do in a is going to thermalize so rho b always looks at that thermal form so you can consider two different cases one case is that there is just totally random unitary, like there's no time, time uh, there's no energy conservation. Then in that case, basically, if we all have a small region B, then the space time mission remission will be zero because there's no, um, because basically whatever you do in the end, you get the same state. Um, but that's only true for small region B. Um, and, and, and on the other hand, if you have um, time evolution that's chaotic, but preserves energy, then there is some way you can influence B. Right? If you have a finite set system, then I could dump in more energy. And then my energy density in B will change. So the local, so even if it's thermalized, the temperature will change. And so that has some contribution. That gives you some contribution for that uh, neutral information. And you can actually calculate the relative entropy term, um, which is actually given just by the change of free energy. So it's like if I start with the state with temperature beta zero, inverse temperature beta zero, then I could dump in some energy or I could take out energy. And then I can change the temperature and you can see the free energy change that determine the relative entropy term. Um, anyway, I will end here. Um, so, so in summary, we propose this quantity and show that it's, uh, it's useful because it gives you some nice bounds and it uh, also give you uh, interpretation in hypothesis testing. Um, of course, there are many open questions. This is very preliminary work. Um, so, so the, yeah, so we need uh, some, we want to know whether there is an explicit calculation uh, that's not involving taking the maximum maximum and and uh, and there is a, a key open question is whether you really need that multiple copy if i take uh, jn is it really equal to j1 or is it really bigger and then we want to study the relation with other information measures and, uh, and more examples like uh, one one example we are working on is the quantum circuit um, which is a generalization of the high random unitary Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, very much for a very informative um, talk. And now the session is open for questions. Gerardo, I think you can. Yeah. So, 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 hi, Gerardo. This is Gerardo Ortiz. So, uh, I, sorry, I came late because I was with the students, but uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I mean, in quantum information uh, in the old days, we were uh, trying to determine precisely correlation functions in space time uh, in quantum circuits. And we were using essentially the same idea uh, as this idea of the power of the single qubit. Indeed, we were using an ancilla essentially with a control operation to determine those correlation functions. So, mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, I mean, since I got, I didn't see the motivation at the very beginning, apart from the bounds that I saw here and the introduction of these quantities, I mean, what is the main, I mean, is there any intellectual difference between these ideas and what you are trying to propose here? Uh, 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 I mean, what, what are the real differences? Sorry. Yeah, um, so I think, uh, um, so here we are mainly trying to pro um, propose a generalization of mutual information, um, which means like, yeah, using the W that's a, um, using W that's a, that's a qubit or qubit here, like what I'm doing is just examples. Um, but uh, what I mainly want is, uh, um, is to define a quantity that's intrinsic to the um, to the system itself. So I so in general W is arbitrarily large. Um, and uh, for example, in the, if you want to reduce to the space-like case, um, you actually um, like in a space-like separated case, this maximization um, is achieved by taking a swap um, between A and W. Um, so you're just measuring mutual information of A and B. But, um, and in that case, of course, W needs to be bigger. So I think that, um, yeah, it's the, the main purpose is not to say, okay, using this ancilla, you can measure this correlation. It's to, gen to define a uh, quantum information measure, um, like the JIB we defined here. Um, 
um, which provides um, um, which which uh, which measures how much correlation there are between the two regions A and B. Um, so so its bound correlation function is one one uh, one property it has, uh, which shows that it's um, it gives you it, it gives you uh, um, it measures how much correlation there are. Um, but for example, this quantity could be much bigger than one, and correlation function is always uh, at most other one. So um, just like the space like mutual information, um, it. Uh, in it's uh, bonding the correlator is not the only reason um, it's interesting. So like it has other properties like it's monotonous and um, um, yeah. that's okay. But now let me let me extend the question because if I if I stick for example to the old ideas, if I want to measure some correlation that involves a string, for example, suppose I want to invade some topological order and I want to put some correlation that invades a string, that's a very hard thing. I mean, in principle, I can do for a finite system and a small system. So is there any way in your in the definition of your quantities that you can bypass that or get you know something else or get information about you know correlations in topologically ordered systems? Um, um, well, I mean, I don't I, I don't think I fully understood the question. Do you mean like a so for um, example, uh, what I'm saying um, is if I want to calculate a string order. Okay, mm -hmm. in the old way, I will need to calculate the control operation where I am having a no local operator that we have to put over the whole system. Okay, I mathematically in a computer I can do. Okay, of course, but that's not, you know, that is not something that is practical if I want to do in a different way, you know, experimentally, for example. So my question is in the way you are doing, can I take your ideas uh, uh, and uh, and sorry, I didn't hear everything that you said, but can I take your ideas and perhaps get information about a string order, okay, uh, in some way? So can you use your ideas uh, uh, of bounds uh, 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 to extract information, uh, to extract topological order information in your system? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, I... I mean, I don't see directly how it helps with that because, well, first of all, um, um, yeah, if you define like the traditionally we define topological state, uh, topological order as a property of a quantum state. So, so if you define it as a property of a quantum state, then um, we don't need this new measure um, because you're just talking about, because everything is like a, a space like like a just a reduced density matrices of that state. So, so like you define this kind of uh, tripartite information, for example, which are which are all properties of a quantum state. We could define other properties, but if we consider a more general, um, for example, a flow quiz system, and we want to define some topological, uh, some characteristics of topology there, then this uh, may be useful because, um, yeah. So, so it's 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 trying to characterize correlation without requiring that they are property of a quantum state. Like if I have a quantum circuit, that's a a quiz system, and then it has some topological um, property. Then um, maybe it's more natural to use um, space like space time correlation, use correlation in time directions to characterize that. Um, so whether it's a string, uh, uh, whether you can probe a string operator will depend on, for example, topology of your region A. So so I, so this doesn't immediately say that, but certainly it's, it's kind of just giving you a more democratic way to measure correlations like doesn't without requiring they have to be space like for example um, um, for example like one motivation is to relate this to holographic duality to, to um, ADS CFD and there we certainly know like when you have this kind of chaotic system for example aspect model then um, correlation functions in time like if I have take two simple from your operators separated in time they Certainly, probe um, very complicated operators. If you do, um, if you if you um, study equal time correlation, it, it, what I mean is that if you look at a simple uh, correlation function between two different time, that's probing something um, like deeper in the in the bulk of the of the holographic field, which tells us that um, you are, you can actually probe something. Some operator is very complicated for the uh, for the quantum state. It's, 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 it's basically because the Heisenberg operator itself could become very complicated. So in that sense, certainly um, there are um, 
there are space time measures that can give you the same message as the spatial um, measures um, in some system, but that will depend on the dynamic. So, so I think in a system where if the dynamics doesn't play a central role, like the uh, the topological state that's a ground state of a gap Hamiltonian, then I don't think this uh, uh, plays a important role. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Jonah. Apparently, we don't have any other question from the audience, so I guess you know it's time to close the close the session. And thank you very much, you know, for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Thank you.